This recording is part of the series of recordings covering the nervous system. And this one is going to specifically look at the structure and function of neurons and also look at some classification of neurons. So we're going to start with just looking at nervous tissue. We're not going to look at neuroglia today, but we're going to be looking at neurons. So I want to show you a microscopic slide of nervous tissue. And what you're seeing here is these here and the processes that you see, those are neurons. You got a neuron here and here and here and here and here. All these other dots that you see, those are actually neuroglia. Those are um, supporting cells for the neurons. So we're going to be looking at the neurons. But I do want to make a mention, uh, mention that when you look at nervous tissue, most of what you'll see are glial cells or neuroglia um, than neurons. But the thing is the neurons are so important, they need these supporting cells that help them. And we'll look at the various type of neuroglial cells in the next recording. So let's just look at the overall generic structure of the neuron. The neuron is the basic functional unit of the nervous system. It has um, a cell body, and you see here in the center, so the cell body is right here. It is referred, the cell body is referred to as the soma. It's the central portion of the neuron, and it contains your normal organelles, like your mitochondria and your Golgi apparatus and you know various organelles, except there's no centrioles. Now centrioles are organelles that are important in cell division. So because of there's no centrioles in the soma of neurons, neurons cannot divide. So that's important. You damage the cell body of a neuron, it's not going to divide, it's gone. You're not going to replace it. Now we do have some few examples of stem cells, neural stem cells, that you see in adults, um, but they're usually inactive except for things involved with smell. We have them in the nose and also parts of the hippocampus, which is in part, in part um, important in memory. Okay, so let's go back. So we have the cell body, so you have your organelles. Now what you'll notice is all of these little dots that you see in here. And what they notice when they were looking at these under the microscope and staining them with a certain stain, they had the stain just picked up real well, these, these particles in here picked up the stain real well. And the person who um, was studying this, they actually named it after this individual. And they refer to these subs, what was they were seeing is nissel bodies or nissel substance. And what really what was picking up all that dye were the um, ribosomes that were part of the rough ER as well as just freely located. And so that's something I just want you to, I'm, I'm mentioning this because it'll be important later, is where you have all those ribosomes, which is, happens to be in the cell body, is it's going to pick up the dye that they typically use when they're looking at these nervous tissue, and it's going to pick up the stain, and it's going to stain a certain way. So I'm just going to keep that in mind. Now, just as a reminder, what ribosomes do, ribosomes are important in protein synthesis. One of the things that those neurons will do is they're going to produce neurotransmitters, which allows us the, ner the nerves to communicate. So that's one of the things that's taking place up there in that, in that soma. Out here, you're seeing all these dendrites. So these cytoplasmic processes that come off this cell body that you're seeing here, those dendrites are specialized for um, receiving information. It, it, carry, it receives information from, say, other neurons, and it directs those, that information towards the cell body. Um, so the, and how these look may be a little bit different. What we're looking at is a 
what I refer to as a multipolar neuron. So it will change a little bit how you see it. But right now, what you'll notice is you have a lot of dendrites. And then what you'll notice down here, and you kind of have to look under the blue, but I'm just going to draw down the center. This is where you see the black right here in the center. That is the axon. So you have multiple dendrites, but you only have one axon per neuron. This is a very long cytoplasmic process. And what it does is it carries impulses away from the cell body. It's going to be involved in what we talk about the transmission of action potentials, which will allow the communication from neuron to neuron or neuron to muscle or neuron to gland. Um, the uh, right here, where it kind of expands out right before you hit the axon, that is called the axolemma. Now the axolemma is a very specialized part of that, of that um, cell membrane, part of that axon. This has a high concentration of voltage-gated channels, which will be important when we talk about action potential generation. Um, sorry, not axolemma. I didn't mean to say axolemma. This is the axon hillock. I apologize. So you see right here is the axon hillock. The axolemma is actually the cell membrane of the axon. So it's the outer cell membrane of the axon. At the very end here, you see these little knobs. Those are synaptic knobs. And this will be involved in transmission of information. And when it's going to be involved, we call synaptic signaling. So here, on this picture, you see all the dendrites here. Here's the nucleus. Here's the axon hillock. Here is the axon. Now, one thing I do want to mention is you compare this picture to this one. That blue that you see kind of wrapped around it is myelin. And some axons have myelin, some don't. We will talk about the significance of myelin later, but myelin does speed up transmission of action potentials. This picture, you don't see the myelin, you just see the axolemma. Now down here, we're zooming in on those synaptic knobs. And so here, this could be another neuron, it could have been a muscle or a gland. You'll notice there's this little gap. And what's going to happen here is a result of this action potentials being propagated along the axons, it's going to result in exocytosis of neurotransmitters that are located here within these little synaptic vesicles. And it will go to, through this synaptic cleft and there'll be receptors located here on the postsynaptic membrane. And that will be involved in things like saying, telling a muscle to contract, or if it's a gland to release a, um, a hormone, or if it's another neuron, to have that communication travel to the next neuron. So that's just kind of, we're going to be looking at that synapse e again, but so this is a very just general introduction. Now one thing though I do want to mention is the axon is not just involved in this transmission of action potentials, which is a means of communication. There is, it's involved in axonal transport. So I want to mention is, okay, so here's the axon. And actually, I'm highlighting the axolemma. What you're seeing, what I'm about to talk about, is inside the axon. When I was mentioning propagation of action potentials, I'm going to go back to this earlier picture, is that actually takes place just along the axolemma. And if the, if the axon is myelinated, it's going to jump. There's going to be these little gaps in myelin right in here, and it's going to jump from and I'm going to call them nodes, you don't have to worry about writing it down yet, is it's going to travel along the axolemma. Now, if the axon is not myelinated, it will propagate through the entire distance of the axon. But what I want to talk about right now is substances that are, travel, that, um, are transported within the axon itself. So I'm talking about axonal transport. There is anterograde 
transport. So example would be I have produced some neurotransmitters up here. They need to come down here and be stored in those synaptic vesicles and then be released under the right conditions. Retrograde transport involves substances that are going in this direction. So enterograde transport, the substance is moving away from the cell body. Retrograde transport, a substance is traveling towards the cell body. So example of retrograde transport would be after I've say released the neurotransmitters, here in the synaptic cleft, I do have enzymes that will break it down. I'll reuptake it here, the breakdown products, and then I'm going to transport them back up here where then I can resynthesize. So that's an example of retrograde transport. Another example of enterograde transport besides transporting neurotransmitters down the axon would be, for example, um, there is a um, structure in your brain called the hypothalamus that produces a couple hormones that are then transported down via anterograde axonal transport and stored down here. And under the right stimulation, it'll be, these hormones will be released into your bloodstream. Now, where this is, the synaptic knob, is actually in your posterior pituitary. So the two hormones that I'm talking about are called ADH, antidiuretic hormone, and oxytocin. And they're actually produced in the hypothalamus. They travel down towards the posterior pituitary via anterograde axonal transport. So that's another example for you. So now I want to talk about classification of neurons. So we can have a structural classification based on how it looks as well as functional. I don't want you to focus so much on structural, but I do want to mention a couple just so you can see that they're a little bit different. When I did that introduction to the nervous system, I talked about afferent neurons and I talked about interneurons and then I talked about efferent neurons. Well, structurally, there can be some differences there. Afferent neurons are sensory neurons. I want you to notice here, this does not look like that previous picture I showed you. The previous picture when I was showing you about what the structure of neurons, they look like this one. That's a multipolar neuron. This one that you see in blue is actually called a unipolar neuron. What you'll notice is you have the cell body here. All of this is the axon. Down here are the dendrites, so it looks a little bit different. The, the functions are still the same. So in this case, this sensory neuron, the dendrites are actually the location where we would have like sensory receptors that would be down here. That information is going to be carried up along the axon, like this. The cell body happens to be located up here on the side. And that information is brought towards the central nervous system. And here you're seeing the spinal cord, which is part of the central nervous system. The two neurons that you see, the one in green and the one that you see in red, are structurally classified as multipolar neurons. So you see a cell body and you see the dendrites coming off of that cell body and then you have that one axon that comes away. So the um, interneurons and the um, motor neurons, they tend to be multipolar neurons. There's other structural types, but I don't care, don't worry that you have to, to, to know that. I want you to understand functional classification the best. So sensory neurons are afferent neurons because they carry information towards the central nervous system. Their cell bodies are going to be located in these structures referred to as ganglion, or the plural would be ganglia. Here, you see right here, that is an interneuron, also referred to an association neuron. That typically, all components of that neuron will be located completely within the central nervous system. If you look at that sensory neuron, the afferent neuron, part, most of it is in the peripheral nervous system, but you'll see a little bit part of the axons in the central nervous system. 
when you look at the motor neuron, which is in the red, the motor neuron is an efferent neuron. So it's carrying in information away from the spinal cord in this case. They're carrying information to our effectors. Those you'll see, those cell bodies are located with in the central nervous system like you see here within the spinal cord. The axons you'll see will be out within the peripheral nervous system. So part of it will be in the central, part of it will be in the peripheral nervous system. So let's kind of go through this again, just looking at a different way, is you have various sensory receptors. This is a very general classification. Enteroreceptors are bringing information from your internal environment. Exteroreceptors from your external environment. Um, so enteroreceptors could be like ones that we're talking about with visceral sensory receptors. Exteroreceptors could be like this receptors associated with your skin. Proprioceptors use, are associated with the muscles and the joints. They're kind of important in um, allowing you to, your body to know your um, limb in different position in space, different, um, lack of a better word, we're just going to leave it at that. We have these different sensory receptors that carry information via afferent neurons to the central nervous system. Central nervous system, we have interneurons. They're going to process that information and then depending on the effector that we want to respond to it, if we want skeletal muscles to contract, the um, efferent neurons will be part of the somatic nervous system. If it's say a smooth muscle, a cardiac muscle, glands, adipose tissue, those are visceral effectors. They're going to be carried along efferent neurons that are part of, you see it says visceral motor, or referred to as autonomic, oops, sorry, I can't spell, autonomic nervous system. And you notice again, peripheral nervous system, you've got those afferent and efferent neurons that are part of it, the effectors um, respond to it. You have your sensory receptors that are actually part of that sensory division. And then we have our central nervous system, the, where it's inter interpreting and integrating various information. So this is going to be the end of looking at the overall structure of neurons and their classification of neurons. Next recording, we're going to be looking at the, fun um, the role of myelin and also what could happen if we demyelinate, if there's demyelination.